Well, good morning, everyone, and, and thanks very much for, uh, for coming to this talk, even though it's kind of early in the morning. Um, my name is Neil Ziering, and I'm going to try to give you a talk today on applying security engineering principles to complex composite systems. Um, I know that sounds like a, a dry and boring government title, and, and it, it is, but I'm going to try to try to liven it up a bit um, with a few anecdotes. Ah, okay, now I have more time. That's great. Okay, so um, here's my little obligatory outline. The, the size of the font is uh, how much time I'm going to spend on each section. Okay. Okay. So the purpose of this talk, and and is to, it's a keynote, right? So I kind of had to keep it high level, is to talk about security when you need to apply it to big, complex systems. You know, and many of us in our career will write, you know, small, I need it fast, simple systems, and we'll write big, complicated, multi-part systems, right? We all do that. And this is really focusing on that, that far end of the spectrum. Uh, where you have a very large system with lots of parts that are heterogeneous and run on different platforms, and they all have to work together, and it ultimately has to be secure. Okay. Um, use of simple security techniques, you know, that, that uh, we learn in, in school or when you go to a, uh, a website and it says, hey, validate your form inputs, those simple rules are, are very important and useful, but the, I contend that they're not sufficient by themselves to make a large complex composite system uh, secure. Now, in, in addition to the systems that we build getting, getting more complex, right, they need to operate in more complex environments. Um, if you think back to, say, I don't know, 10 years ago, the system was already pretty darn complex then, but at least most of them were running on your own premise. <laughs> and, and nowadays, uh, that's almost never the case, not even in government, and, and certainly not in private sector. And uh, secondly, uh, to establish security for a, a large complex system is hard enough, but then you have to maintain its security over time. And that's where these security engineering principles can really come in handy because uh, you can ask yourself as you're doing uh, uh, changes to your system or adding new functionality, uh, did that principle um, that I chose for my system, does that still apply? Okay. Um, Okay, so who am I, right? Uh, ben gave you my title. I've been at NSA for 31 years, uh, all but a few months of that in uh, cybersecurity in one form or another. Uh, I've worked on the security for many large uh, NSA mission systems and composite system designs, and you know, later in my career as, um, on various boards that look at the design of such systems and approve them and things like that. Um, I've had the privilege at speaking at OWASP events twice in the past, uh, once here in DC and once out in Denver. And uh, you know, when I got this invite, I, I was very excited because I have a great deal of respect for OWASP and, and the work that they do for the community. Uh, you know, I, I'm involved in a number of software assurance, software security activities within the Department of Defense. And when we're thinking about like source material, OWASP is, is always a reliable place. Uh, to get that, and uh, just, you know, you know, my hat is, if I was wearing a hat, my hat would be off to OWASP for what they do uh, for our, for the security community. Okay, um, something I'll add to my background that, you know, try to make things a little bit fun here. I've been working on, on web security sort of on and off with other security um, since the first release of the Mosaic browser. Um, now, those of you who really know web history remember the, the Mosaic browser, uh, you know, written um, uh, with the Motif toolkit on X Windows in, I don't know, mid-90s or something. Uh, it was, you know, very basic and, and rudimentary by today's standards, although it had a bunch of features that Chrome still doesn't have, but whatever. Um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, even back then, we were looking at this new thing called the web and saying, is this going to take off or is everybody going to stick with, with Gopher and FTP? And we, we realized right away that security was going to be an issue. And me and my colleagues being at NSA, the first thing we thought of was, well, why isn't this encrypted? <laughs> So the first web security project I ever worked on was uh, an attempt to encrypt uh, HTTP sessions, and we, you know, 
hacked up a server and we hacked up the browser and of course it was NSA so we had to use hardware for the encryption and you know, all that kind of, it was a lot of fun. And uh, um, that was well before SSL was invented. And we, and we later you know, showed people what we had done and like, thank God we didn't do it that way because it was, try, we tried to put the layer of the encryption on top of HTTP which was like a huge mistake. Putting it underneath as, as SSL and TLS do was definitely the way to go. Um, and I'll try to tell some more um, anecdotes as, as we go along. Um, okay, composite systems. Um, why are today's systems hard to secure? There's a whole bunch of reasons, right? And, and if you work in these systems, which you know most people at an event like this would, you know why this is, right? The number of diversity of software components is just sort of through the roof. Long gone are the days when you write like your entire big complicated system in one language on one platform using one toolkit. Um, you know, that's, uh, I, I talk to students when I go recruiting and their class projects are like that. <laughs> but uh, you know, projects out in the real world, uh, certainly the ones I'm familiar with within government are not like that anymore. The diversity of internal interfaces. Your, your external interface might be very homogeneous. You know, it might be a just, okay, I'm going to present a web service, and I'm going to keep it clean facing outward, but your internal interfaces tend to be very complicated, right? And they're of diverse types, right? You might have some that are like RESTful services. You might have some that are message brokers. You might have some that are basically a bunch of components talking to an SQL or column store database. Um, you might have you know, some kooky uh, built in-house uh, file passing service. Um, we have one at NSA and, and we open sourced it so all of you can enjoy it too. <laughs> it's called Niagara Files, get it from Apache. Some friends of mine worked on it. Um, so you, know, you have all these diverse internal interfaces which raises the complexity of your code because you have to deal with them, okay? There's the diversity of components and frameworks and platforms and management tools. My dog woke me up early this morning and I couldn't get back to sleep. So I was just like browsing, you know, technical articles and crap. And I read one about uh, a cascading failure in a Kubernetes system where all the different agents uh, that these particular folks had layered on their system like sucked up all the resources and caused this cascading failure. And I'm like, wow. Why did they need all those agents? But every one of them, they had a reason why it had to be there, right? So there's a variety of, of types of entities that depend on your system, right? To deliver them trustworthy data or, or, uh, or to provide them a service. Um, external providers, right, obvious. And lastly, the variety of security controls that you might impose on your system or that uh, regulators or compliance regimes might require to be imposed on your system. Um, in, in NSA, right, we're an intelligence agency. Um, we have tremendous, uh, tremendously complex compliance regimes that we have to comply with, and all our systems have to implement those. Okay, well, not all of them, but most of them. The ones that like, you know, serve up the cafeteria menus and stuff are a little less, but... Uh, so that variation uh, can drive complexity as well. And think a moment about sort of modern development environments. The other day I was just trying some, uh, uh, you know, hobbyist stuff at home. I was trying to learn to use a, a serverless compute on a cloud framework. And uh, I said, hey, you know, I'll just fire up Eclipse and, and try to write some, some code, follow a tutorial. And you know, just downloading the dependencies took multiple minutes, and I wasn't even on Wi-Fi. I had actually plugged in the Ethernet cable. So, you know, I had no idea what was going into this thing. You know, it was kind of like, you know, whatever Maven Central thinks is good, that's what's going in there. That's fine for a hobbyist project. Telling a government auditor, yeah, I just put whatever software in Maven Central thought was appropriate, maybe not a sufficient answer. <laughs> okay, so... The, the proliferation uh, that we see in sort of modern software development environments, while it's great for productivity, uh, uh, can, can complicate the security picture. And we'll talk more about that just a little bit later. Um, trust relationships is another aspect. 
When I look at how modern adversaries are attacking modern systems, they're often exploiting trust relationships. Uh, and we'll hit that in the principles as well. Um, yeah. And of course, this, this is my favorite part. Each of your trusted parties that, that you trust, they trust other folks, right? So you have this kind of whole transitive thing going on that, uh, uh, you know, can expose your system to a risk that you didn't think you had, right? And we've seen that in a number of high-profile uh, breaches. Okay. Um, another aspect, um, man, I probably went on too long with this whole complexity thing. I apologize. Is the types of, of sort of entities that use your system, right? If we think back to the uh, uh, old, old, old days, you had one kind of user. It was a human being coming to your system with a browser, and you like to serve them content. Nowadays, you have, still have those, right? Human users, they're coming from a variety of browsers. Um, but you also have mobile apps that are trying to hit your, your system. Uh, you have non-people devices that you may have to deal with, like Internet of Things devices that are calling your services. And they have different needs than the human beings. And then you have other web systems within your company or within your government agency or with your partners that are attempting to your, call your system to get some service. Okay. Uh, I talked about policy and regulatory complexity. Right? Uh, that took kind of a big jump with the uh, uh, European GDPR uh, being introduced a year or two ago. Um, there are higher expectations of scale and resiliency today. Right? Everybody expects your system to be up all the time. Um, now, many enterprises choose to go to a cloud provider to get that scale, and, and that's fine, but that introduces its own complexities uh, because now you have to configure your security um, sort of not necessarily with your on-prem tools, but whatever policy and control tools the uh, cloud provider happens to offer. And those may not be the same from provider to provider. Okay, and then lastly, there's your whole build chain. Um, whatever uh, uh, form of continuous development or continuous integration you might be doing, uh, those systems nowadays tend to be very closely connected to your production systems, and do they represent a path whereby an attacker can get in to your system. Okay, so in the principles that are coming up, uh, we're gonna use this example, and I'm gonna refer back to it. Uh, I wanted to put the actual uh, US signals intelligence system on, uh, in here, uh, but it wouldn't fit. So, <laughs> but it is a large complex composite system. Um, I did a lot of uh, security architecture uh, work for it about a year, uh, a decade ago. And um, so this, this uh, is a smart city example. It's adapted from a number of examples that I found in academic literature about smart cities. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I've been studying Internet of Things in sort of my day job for a while. So I thought this was a fun example. So what's going on in this puppy? Um, you know, you got the kind of the users at the bottom, uh, uh, passengers who want to buy tickets and ride on the subway, and that guy is running because he's about to miss his train. Um, and of course, there's a database that holds the user information. Then you kind of have the, the management system in the center, and it has its own database, which probably isn't the same type of database as the one below it. You have some city officials who want to administer and oversight, uh, oversee this whole business. You have the whole uh, uh, ticketing system, right, which has to deal with money and credit cards and, and all the uh, regulatory complexity that comes with that, uh, as well as with these devices that are sort of emplaced all around the city and probably connected to the internet in 19 different ways. Um, you know, you got an external weather provider you have the, the buses and subway trains and traffic lights and parking meters and all those devices that are feeding you telemetry. Um, and then you have the transit engineers who want all this data and have their own systems that they need it supplied to. So, and, and I wanted to make this even more complex, but it sort of exceeded my PowerPoint skills. <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, but let's, let's just, this is not sort of that complex by modern standards. Um, you know, how, how many people say, would say that this level of complexity is sort of comparable to the kinds of systems that you build or test in your day job? 
Okay, a few. And a few of them, you were probably saying, no, nah, the stuff I deal with in, at work is way more complex than this, which is certainly, certainly true of my stuff. But, um, but like I said, you know, PowerPoint is limited to how much you can fit on the slide. This one's reasonable because it has a lot of potential vulnerabilities, right? You can see it just by looking at it. You got a whole bunch of internal interfaces with arrows going every which way, which is, in my experience, very realistic. Uh, you know, you have databases, multiple of them. You have different types of users with different rights and different privileges and different expectations. And you have different uh, uh, interfaces, right? You have a regular web interface for browsers. You got, you know, mobile apps. You have uh, um, interfaces out to uh, separate devices like buses and trains and ticket machines. So I think is reasonably, reasonably realistic. Um, so, so everybody's memorized that. We're going to go on. Okay. So another important thing, one of, one of the first principles we'll hit, is that security is about mission, right? We, Im we impose, we build security into our systems because that system has a job to do. So the first thing you have to know about a system where you're going to secure it is well, what job is it expected to do and which things are more important than other things, right? So for this system, job one is safety, right? We're talking about buses and trains running around a city. Safety is paramount. You know, next, we got a privacy thing, right? This is, is holding information about people, so it's got PII. So we have privacy things that are, are imposed on us by uh, a policy or, or state law, et cetera. And then we, you want to optimize the, the services and the revenue, right? Um, the city needs to, to take in money to maintain the system. Um, and then, uh, you know, sustain the trust of the citizens. And important, but less important than the other things, get the passengers where they need to go as fast as they can. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Now, this is just a restatement of some of the inputs and outputs. I like to draw this sort of diagram um, for systems that I work on so I can kind of enumerate what are the, what are the pieces of data they're expected to be feeding this system, what are the types of, of users that it's expected to serve, and what external systems depend upon it. Um, understanding those dependencies has, has uh, bitten me and colleagues of mine in the butt any number of times. Um, I'll give an example or two as we go forward, but it's, it's exceptionally important to understand what those external systems are counting on your system to provide to them, right? And, and how that imposes security requirements on your system that maybe didn't apply to the human users. Okay, okay so this is the best part, the actual principles. Now, the principles uh, uh, here are all sort of standard security engineering principles, but I uh, read an article a couple of months ago and I really liked uh, how the principles were stated in that article. So in most cases I've adopted the form of wording uh, that, uh, that Dr. Sagery used. And by coincidence, uh, Dr. Sagery was actually a colleague of mine at NSA back in the early 90s. <laughs> he worked there back then and uh, uh, on security engineering, in fact. And uh, then he went off to like research community and other stuff. And, but he's still doing security engineering today and he decided to capture uh, his knowledge in a, in a book. So I'm in the middle of reading the book, but that's an article. Um, so why, why use principles, right? Um, and this is, this is kind of a, a serious question. A lot of folks that I have seen in my experiences within government do security engineering by what I might call a checklist approach. You know, they may have a approval or accreditation uh, uh, set of boxes that they have to check, and they approach the security of their system by saying, well, I've got a box here that says I have to have user authentication, so I'm going to put that in. And then I get to check that box. And that's not a sound way to go about making your system trustworthy and accomplishing the mission that that system is intended to do. Uh, all it really achieves is checking boxes. And uh, what I've found, uh, especially when I came in to be the security architect on, on a troubled project in uh, 2006, um, was that that approach doesn't work. It doesn't lead to systems that actually are secure enough to hold 
the sensitive mission data that, that you need them to hold. Um, so we use, we create a very wide variety of systems and simple rules are cool, right? You know, validate your form inputs, remember to log key events, all good, um, but it's not sufficient. If you're gonna be engineering complex systems, you need uh, rules that are general and applicable to those uh, complex systems, right? So sanitize form inputs is, is a simple rule of thumb that derives from a more general principle of don't trust externally supplied data. Um, and as I said earlier, the, the most important thing about uh, picking the principles that you're going to apply for your system and then applying them consistently is not at the beginning when you're building the system and you understand all the parts, but like a couple of years later when you're trying to maintain it and, and it's grown and it's gotten more complex and it's interfaced to more other things. And that's when sticking to the principles really matters. Okay. So principle number one, we apply cybersecurity in order to make mission go. Okay. Um, you know, within NSA, we have uh, tons of different systems, right? I'll just uh, pick one as an example. Um, particular one I'm thinking about holds data from uh, red teams. Red teams go out. I mean, you've all probably dealt with red teams. They go out. They collect data about a system. They bring it back uh, after they've done their attacking. And they need to be able to write reports and understand the vulnerabilities they found and all those other things. But that data is very sensitive. Right? That's data about the vulnerabilities of a real system. And it needs to be uh, protected. It needs to be tracked uh, uh, who used it and how. So you know, it, it, the mission goal in that case is prevent that vulnerability information from falling into the wrong hands. Therefore, you know, that system has to have certain security controls. Okay? So understand the mission that your system is intended to provide. Uh, and it's sometimes easy to get away from that when you're sort of down in the bowels of coding some particular component. But you know, try to get, you know, lift your head every now and then and say, okay, what's the big picture here? I'm building this you know, particular web service that's gonna serve a mobile app, but you know, what's the bigger purpose uh, uh, being served by this whole you know, agglomeration of containers and uh, web services and databases. In the example, right, the mission purpose is getting people around the city safely and uh, protecting and preserving the city's investment in transit. Um, and so, you know, all of our security principles should somehow trace back to those mission purposes. Okay? You craft your security to protect the mission functions prioritized by mission importance and you might not add some features because they would conflict with your mission purposes. Um, I've got a jokey example. I think it's on the next slide. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, that first bullet's kind of obvious. It, you know, it's not just about installing everything you possibly can, and we'll talk more about that later. In the jokey example, residents of our city would love to be able to adjust the traffic lights so that they get green all the way to work, right? But that might have some safety implications for all the other people on the roads. If, um, you know, individual passengers could just like be blopping the traffic lights anytime they felt like it. So we're probably not gonna include that feature because it optimizes for goal number five, improve transit times at the cost of goal number one, uh, you know, which was safety. All right. So security about mission. Now, if you really understand, and, and this is actually a failing that I remember from earlier in my own career, we were developing uh, uh, communication systems for, for military folks, and you know, NSA culture, we were all about confidentiality, and man, this data's gonna be encrypted, and it's gonna be encrypted really well, and, and we had a good understanding of how uh, 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 other nations tried to break our encryption. We weren't going to let that happen. And we forgot that the thing that mattered most to these military users was that their radio was up and available when they needed it. 
Okay? And that was a case where we sort of let uh, security controls that we knew a lot about how to make and, and build run away with us, and we weren't thinking about the end mission that that system was supposed to be uh, providing. Okay? We're better about that nowadays. This was a long time ago. Okay, principle number two. Security is about understanding the risks to your system and then mitigating them. And, and this is a step that I've seen people skip. And it, it certainly applies in the sort of checklist approach, right? If you're just checking boxes, you don't know what risks your system is really facing. You're checking boxes. So um, uh, let's see if I can think of another good example. Um, there was a, a system I was working on. Uh, I ended up being the security architect of it later, that was intended to accept a whole bunch of uh, sort of real-time data uh, from uh, basically a combat, combat zone, dangerous area, and be able to provide sort of real-time um, warning, uh, a real-time uh, alerting to, um, to you know, military members if some event ha was happening that was of interest to them. And that particular system accepted data from a whole bunch of different parties who were going to rely on our system to protect that data, right? This was data they never shared before. It was purely local, but now they were going to consider sharing it into this sort of large pool so that we could give better alerts uh, uh, and more complete, more informative alerts out to, to soldiers and stuff. And the, the person who was running that, uh, that development program uh, found that if he couldn't clearly elucidate to these other uh, information holders how his system was going to protect their information, they weren't willing to share it. <laughs> and um, so we had to understand what risks they thought were important to their data and then be able to build the right security controls uh, uh, you know, in this uh, uh, system so that it would um, mitigate the risks that they were worried about and so that we could clearly explain to them, yeah, if you share your data to us, um, you know, we're going to protect it in the following ways, right? It's classified, so we're going to do that. And, you know, only people with certain type of mission are supposed to see it, so we're going to do that. And, you know, we can only have it for two weeks, so we're going to do that. Um, and so that was critical. And then once we could clearly explain that to these other information owners, they were willing to put their information in our system, and it saved a lot of lives. So we had to understand the, not only the threats that we envisioned, but the threats that these other people who owned the information envisioned. Okay. And the other thing is, it's really important to understand the impact of a threat. All right? You may say, okay, I, I, I'm worried that my, you know, an attacker might come at me and deny service to this component. What would the impact of that be? And um, if the impact is low, you might not choose to invest a great deal in, uh, in protecting that component, right? Because security ends up being about trade-offs. You can't always provide all the security features that you might want because, you know, you got a job to do. you got to get this system out to, out to customers. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, this, is, this bit's important. So when you think about this particular principle, it, it's sometimes helpful to think about a risk that might apply to data in your system, and that long-winded example I just talked about was about, about risk to data, or risk to the compromise of the control of your system. All right, so what, what are impacts to control? Most typical one that we see in web, web systems all the time are injection attacks where uh, an attacker could come to your system and uh, uh, inject something. Okay, for, for what? Sorry. <laughs> Is that? Oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were telling me I, I had four of something. Sorry. Um, so, right, we all know about injection, you know, command injection and SQL injection, lots of bizarre types of XML injection. I used to study XML a lot, so I thought those were really cool. Um, so that's about uh, uh, control, right? If an attacker can inject a, a scrap of 
shell code that is going to end up running on your server, they've managed to introduce some code execution that you didn't want and is probably uh, uh, going to do something nasty to your system that, that is going to be harmful to your mission. And then impacts of compromised data will hit in the next slide. Uh, and then lastly, impact a compromise of access. And uh, this is one where, you know, some users are counting on your system being up for them, right? They, they need to catch their train to work and they need to buy a ticket. Um, and if your system isn't there for them, then, uh, and these, uh, you know, that one obviously is availability. Uh, so if you understand how uh, these impacts harm your system, or the mission that you're trying to get your system to perform, then you'll better be able to craft security measures that will reduce or eliminate those impacts. Okay. Um, now we're gonna focus on data for just a moment. And this is an exercise that uh, uh, I've used in security engineering and security architecture context, context several times, and that's find the crown jewel data. Okay. And, um, uh, it isn't, doesn't always show up where you'd expect, I think is the, the lesson I've learned from doing this a lot. So crown jewel data, and there's lots of ways to think about it, but I just picked a simple one for this presentation. Uh, the bottom axis is how important confidentiality is for your data. You know, and it's, if confidentiality is compromised, unauthorized parties got hold of this data, how high is the impact? Not much impact on the left, very, very serious grave impact on the right. And then the vertical axis, same thing for integrity, right? If someone could compromise the integrity, then higher up impact is, is very serious. So your crown jewel data, well, like let's look at bottom left corner is stuff that you don't much care about the confidentiality, harm is low, integrity, harm is low. So cafeteria menus. Somebody changes the ravioli to something else, you know, not a big deal. Something where the integrity is very important but the confidentiality is not, is time, right? Many of our systems depend on an accurate idea of the time, and, uh, but it's not confidential. Everybody knows what time it is, just not allowed to change it. It's supposed to be accurate. Uh, so that's kind of up in the, the top left corner. Your crown jewel data is the stuff in the top right corner where the confidentiality impact is very high and the integrity impact is very high. And so one exercise that you can go through for understanding your risks is identifying that crown jewel data and, uh, and then saying, okay, if there's anywhere in my system that's handling the crown jewel data, then I'm gonna pay extra attention to testing it, to ensuring that it has proper controls in place, that it has proper logging, uh, et cetera, okay? Um, So let's think about the example for a minute, the smart city system. What's the crown jewel data there? Uh, the credentials for the uh, traffic control system, the thing that lets you uh, adjust the, the um, transit schedules and the, and the parking meters and all those, the, the credentials that let you do that stuff, that, that's crown jewel data. Anybody gets hold of that, impact's very high. The passenger trip records may be crown jewel data. Um, maybe, maybe not. They certainly have privacy impact or, or uh, regulatory compliance impact if they're compromised. Uh, and the resident, uh, the PII about the, uh, the passengers. Uh, the telemetry data from the buses and trains is probably critical to both um, the safe uh, use of those vehicles as well as um, uh, managing them in a way that is good for uh, keeping them running, like maintenance. So that may be uh, very important, but that one maybe not. You know, maybe the telemetry from the bus is, is not that confidential. Anybody can observe the bus going down the street and say, oh, there it is. But the integrity might be very important, okay? If I can reach in as an attacker and alter the telemetry data so it always says the bus has plenty of fuel, uh, after a few hours, that's really going to disrupt the bus system because nobody's going to fuel up the buses and they're all going to, like, you know, stop running. <laughs> Even more, plenty of examples in the train system as well. Okay, 
Number three. This is one of my favorites. And uh, my friend Rob uh, is, is a big fan of this one as well. Um, understanding security uh, um, depends on understanding forms of, of attack. Uh, an old um, mentor of mine, who is actually also a mentor of, of Sammy and is mentioned in the, in the foreword of his book, used to uh, uh, joke with new hires at NSA, uh, what's a six-letter word that begins with A that means evaluate? And everybody like, what the heck is that? Right, right. And uh, then he would shout, attack. <laughs> because he felt, and, and I still agree with him, that the best way to really understand the security of a system is to understand how it can be attacked, or ideally even try to attack it and see how successful you can be, okay? Now, there are many uh, common types of attacks, especially in, in areas that have been sort of well studied, like web security and cryptography. Um, understand those common types of attacks, all right? And, and the malicious tradecraft that sort of depends on them. Uh, OWASP, for example, publishes an excellent top 10 uh, web vulnerabilities. If you're thinking about web security, that's like the best place to start, is understanding how each of those vulnerabilities work. And think about if you were an attacker, how could you take advantage of them to uh, uh, gain advantage for yourself or to harm a system? Okay. Um, next, think about your particular industry sector, right? So I'm in government side. Look at successful attacks in that sector and think, hey, what did the attacker do there? And how were they successful? And would those same, that same tradecraft work against my system? Okay. Um, and that's kind of cool for that sort of thing, being an NSA, um, right? Because we have both a cybersecurity mission and an intelligence mission that is about, quite frankly, uh, you know, exploiting um, uh, foreign intelligence targets in order to gain intelligence. And uh, so I, I always joke that, hey, if I don't have to wonder what a nation state attacker might do in a given situation, I can like, go down the hall and find one and ask them. Uh, so that's kind of fun. But uh, in complex composite systems, the attacks are often correspondingly complex. Okay? So. You know, there's always that, that old adage that the attacker has to, uh, the defender has to cover everything, the attacker only has to be right once. My experience in, in looking at attacks on complex systems, that's not quite true anymore. The system complexity usually means that the attacker has to be right a couple of times, two, three, four times, in order to reach maybe that crown jewel data or that critical functionality that they're trying to interfere with. And um, so that's, an advantage to you as a defender. You have sort of multiple chances to block that attacker, right? Maybe uh, prevent uh, injection at your initial user web interface, but oh, what if that succeeds? Well, now they're sitting inside uh, a Docker container where my web server is running. How do I prevent them from making that next step, like back to the database, uh, and so on, okay? So in the, in the smart city example, if an attacker was intent on corrupting the bus system so that they could demand ransom from the city, which I think uh, we all agree that's a reasonable scenario these days, um, they might start with the passenger website because that's public, anybody can access it, jump from there to the trip information system, which depends on information from the bus operation system, and once they're in the bus operation system, they can, you know, screw up the bus schedules and cause the buses to run out of gas and all the rest of that kind of thing. Okay, four. This is one that we, we apply religiously at NSA. Assume that attackers already know the structure and operation of your system. If, you know, if you're in a security meeting with your friends or, or clients, or enemies, whoever, and they say, well, we don't think that, that this interface over here is subject to attack because nobody knows it exists. You can like throw the BS flag, <laughs> okay? Uh, n don't assume your attackers don't know that your, how your system works because they will. And um, uh, they can gain that all kinds of ways. You know, uh, I've talked to our red teamers, for example. How did you figure out 
had that that uh, military system works so that you could get into it. And they're like, oh well, you know, we just uh, went around on a bunch of websites, and some dude had a year-old presentation where he explained the architecture of the whole system. Okay. <laughs> uh, another reason why I didn't get to put the architecture of the U.S. SIGINT system into the slide deck. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, you got documentation that's unwisely posted, how many times we read about people leaving stuff in like public uh, uh, cloud storage buckets that uh, attackers could go and pick up. Uh, a classic one in web systems are error messages. You make your web error messages really detailed and they expose, you know, what software you're using and maybe what version and how your code is structured because they give a whole backtrace of, of where the failure happened. Um, logs, uh, I've, I've heard of attacks where um, uh, attackers were able to find where the logs were backed up, not the primary location, but the backups, and go read the logs and understand the system from that. And then, of course, some systems can just have information leak vulnerabilities. And uh, you may not think an information leak is a serious vulnerability, but that's what Heartbleed was, it was an information leak vulnerability. So it, that in that particular case, exposed crown jewel data like passwords. So don't rely on security through obscurity. Uh, yeah, so start with that premise that the attackers know all your internal interfaces. They may not be able to reach them, but they know they're there. Okay. I went to a really cool talk about attacking uh, uh, a cloud system a couple of years ago at, at the RSA conference. And um, there was a lot of that in there where uh, that particular attack, they just went after like internal interfaces that were insufficiently protected by, in that particular case, uh, cloud policy. And you had to know it was there in order to attack it. Um, but you, know, you kind of have to assume that they know that stuff. Okay. Um, you know, names of, of assets, uh, uh, names of APIs and what parameters they take, all that stuff. Um, don't consider that stuff secret. And we are gonna, there are some things you do have to consider secret, we'll talk about that in a minute, but this stuff, don't think of it that way. Okay, um, oh yeah, there, well there it is. There are some things that you gotta think about as secret, but you should keep those things small and then protect the heck out of them like the private keys that, that uh, support you know, your SSL or TLS interface, um, uh, uh, passwords, uh, tokens that you may get from another system that permit you to access that system for some period of time, those things uh, you should be more careful with. I mean, we've all heard horror stories about people leaving secrets like this in their code repositories, which then get uploaded to GitHub or some such thing. Um, and we laugh about those things, but unfortunately they're still happening, <laughs> okay? So think carefully about where your secrets are and um, you know, make sure that they're either uh, uh, encrypted and protected properly or stored in some kind of system that is specifically designed to store them and, and only give them to authorized parties, uh, that kind of stuff. So for example, in, in the smart city system, um, if the bus telemetry ingest is only supposed to accept connections from the, the Internet of Things gateway, right, to receive the, the telemetry information from the buses, um, then that should be an authenticated interface. Uh, so that, you know, in a variety of ways, and there are lots of mechanisms you can use to do that, um, to ensure that only the authorized connections succeed. Don't assume that the attacker just doesn't know where the telemetry goes because they'll find out, and then they'll be able in to inject false telemetry into your, um, into your system. Okay, principle five, integrity. Um, this is a fundamental property. Without integrity, kind of everything else falls apart because you can't rely on it. You might say during a security review, well, I know that this access control check will be enforced because here it is in my code. There's no way around it the check always happens. Great. If your code does not have integrity, if, if an attacker can reach in and change, you know, your node.js code or your, your um, you know, Java jars that you've uploaded, then they can easily uh, make that bypass happen and then the check that you're relying on is not enforced. 
So code integrity is extremely important. Uh, protect your code, your source code, and your build system as much or more than your actual production system. Because if the build system gets hosed, you can't rely on the, on the production system anymore. Protect the backups of your code. This is, this is, this next one, be aware of components of your system loaded from elsewhere. And, and I, you know, sort of ranted briefly earlier about uh, modern platforms and how they uh, load in dependencies. This is a more serious problem than I realized. I was uh, taking a briefing from a, uh, a specialist security company a couple of years ago, uh, and they gave an example of the provenance uh, and all the dependencies that went into a common uh, open source system. And uh, you know, ironically, it was one that NSA had open sourced, so I kind of felt you know, a little bad about that. Simple system, wasn't that complicated, had over 700 dependencies. Uh, out to five layers deep, where the main system required X, which required Y, which required Z, which ran out of letters, which required W. Um, that's, uh, it's, it's a lot to be aware of, but it, it's important. Because if one of those things had a vulnerability and you didn't know about it, you could be exposed, right? Um, all right. Uh, so there are various uh, uh, software analysis tools that can help with that. And if your pro project depends heavily on external frameworks, then, then you, know, you might consider using that type of tool along with your static analysis and other, other code checking tools. Okay. Um, configuration files, obviously extremely important. Uh, treat them just like code. Okay, principle six. I gotta hurry up because I'm running out of time. Um, focus on secrets uh, for a moment. Cybersecurity functions and the secrets that go with them are always gonna be targets. What's the first thing attackers go after these days when they get to a new system and gain entry? They go after credentials, okay? Whether those are SSH keys or, or you know, user passwords or Windows authentication tokens, et cetera. And so think about where those things are. Um, you know, within NSA, we do a lot of access controls using um, an ABAC model and there's a central system that knows all the users' uh, rights and clearances and things like that. That system is protected like crazy because, you know, what users are authorized to what data is sort of central to our entire protection model. And it's also monitored like crazy and so forth. Um, modern complex systems embed a lot of features that use a lot of secrets, right? Uh, passwords, private keys, tokens, et cetera. Uh, we already talked about the next bit. Segment your secrets. Don't, you know, let's say you get a private key and it's associated with a certificate for your public website. That's great. It's for your public website, just use it for that. Don't use it for all your internal interfaces because now you've stored that really, really important private key in 19 different places inside your system. Okay, uh, we talked about crown jewel data already. Oh yeah. Some secrets are definitely gonna get compromised, right? You, end user passwords, yeah. some end user is always gonna get their password stolen or something. Think about what the impact to your system is and then build in recovery measures, right? Think about it. If, you, if, you're, if a user called you up and said, you know, so in our smart city example, let's say it was the mayor, just to make a jokey example. It says, my password to, to managing the entire subway system has been stolen. Uh, how quickly could you turn off all the mayor's privileges so that the, the attacker that stole his password would have no ability to harm your transit system? Okay. Um, yeah, that's too complicated an example. We'll skip that one. Okay. Uh, assume your system will have malicious insiders. Uh, unfortunate uh, uh, truth these days, NSA has had its share of, of issues with this. Um, you can't eliminate that threat because you know even an insider who isn't malicious but does something accidental and stupid can can cause harm to your system. Uh, so you have to think about reducing that impact. 
right? Uh, my personal insider threat mitigation model uh, is deter, detect, and defeat. Um, one of the security principles inside NSA is that no action is anonymous. Uh, every action is tracked back to an, either an authorized user or an authorized system. Uh, n not just users have credentials, all the systems have credentials too. Uh, and you only want to give each of those entities as much privilege as they actually need to do whatever job they're, they're being asked to do. Um, and then, of course, once you have all this information about who's doing what, you can't just let it sit in a database somewhere. You have to analyze it and, and look for misbehavior. Um, okay. So uh, consider an insider in the transit system. They're responsible maybe for vehicle management and maintenance. Okay, this is you know, an individual who fixes the trains when they break. That's a very, very important job. But it has nothing to do with the ticket system uh, uh, or selling uh, fares or dealing with credit cards. So make sure that that user only has access to the vehicle maintenance logs and things of that nature that they need to do their job and doesn't have like sort of global privileges throughout the system. And then a really simple analytic uh, that you can use to look for this sort of misbehavior is just looking for permission denied log entries. You know, average user have a few of those a day, some person has several thousand, maybe that's something you'd want to look into. Okay. Understand the security that your system relies upon from external service providers or platforms. This is especially important in sort of hosting provider, cloud provider sort of cases. You're going to write your system, it's going to run off-prem on some cloud service, that's cool. What does it depend on the cloud provider to give you, and what parts do you have to build in? All right, understanding that division is, it can be very difficult. And then the parts that the cloud provider does offer you, how do you configure those correctly and, and sustain them over time? Okay. Um, and that applies to sort of your standard cloud providers, you know, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, et cetera. It applies to places where you put uh, your source code and other artifacts like a, a GitHub, um, all those sorts of services. Okay. Um, so in the uh, uh, example, right, the vehicle telemetry data is very high volume, so the city is not attempting to process it all themselves. They run it through a cloud provider. Um, and uh, it gets stored there until, it's, uh, until it can be forwarded. So understand what the cloud provider provides uh, and which bits you have to provide. Okay, we're almost done, hang in there. And then the flip side of that coin is understand what security uh, your system is offering that others are depending upon. And I've seen this bite folks uh, in, in my work plenty of times. Um, there was this one particular system that performed a validation check on a certain type of important data. And it was very convenient, it was easy to use, so a whole bunch of other things depended on it. They would like send these pieces of data to the system, it would validate them, report back that one's good, that one's not so good. The folks who ran that system didn't fully understand uh, uh, how many other systems were relying on them and the extent in which they relied upon them. This was accidental, but it could have been a malicious attack. Turned out to be an accident, thank goodness. And that system went down and like all these other systems ground to a halt because they were all synchronously waiting for their little validation requests to come back, <laughs> right? And um, that was an availability attack against one little system, it was accidental, but it was still uh, an availability compromise uh, where the folks involved had no idea the extent that their little availability interruption would like, you know, screw up the mission of all these other systems, okay? Uh, your system may be a, a source of data upon which others rely for its integrity or its confidentiality. Um, they may store data at your system which they're counting on you to protect, like that other example I talked about with the uh, real-time alerting system. Uh, they may count on your system to uh, um, be able to provide provenance information about data on which they rely, uh, financial data, for example. Okay, in, in the uh, smart city example, 
um, if you remember the diagram, the telemetry data came through our system before going out to the transit engineering systems. And I'm, I'm looking back at that later like, was that a good idea? You know, maybe the telemetry data should have gone straight to the transit engineers, but you know, sorry, we're stuck with it. No budget to change it. Um, so now we have a dependency. The transit engineering system depends on our system to ingest that data with integrity and provide it within certain latency bounds out to the transit engineering system. And uh, understanding that dependency would change how we engineered our system and how we protected it. Finally, number 10, plan for failure. Okay. Uh, plan for compromise. You know, uh, some part of your system will experience a security problem or it may get compromised through an attack or even an accident like that example I gave earlier. If you plan for that event, if you think about the failure scenarios that would have high impact for your system, uh, then you can greatly reduce the mission impact. And, and we all know about simple stuff like assume you're going to lose data and, and go you know, rehearse restoring from backup. Um, seen plenty of systems that didn't do that, but still we all know that one already. But, uh, you know, somebody red teams your system or, or does some pen testing against it, can you see the evidence in the logs? Can you understand what they did? Um, do you have mechanisms for halting malicious behavior if and when you detect it? Uh, do you have mechanisms, you know, let's say an attacker gets into your system and, you know, three-star general is breathing down your neck saying, I need to know if that data still has integrity, if I can still trust that data, right? And sir, someone may, I don't care if it leaked, I need to know if I can trust it, right? Um, you need to be able to answer that question. Because if you can't, the general is gonna assume that he can't trust that data and mission gets called off and everything has to be rebuilt and, and you know, a lot of, a lot of problems. So, you know, think about backup and encryption best practices, hold exercises, do rehearsals, drills, that kind of thing, right? Um, and last topic, which I'm gonna have to rush through because I'm just about out of time, is maintaining security, right? Complex st composite systems are never static. They're always getting new functionality bolted on the sides. Um, assume your system's gonna change. Identify the key elements that can't change because external parties depend on them. That's very important. And, uh, and then incorporate testing of that sort of into each stage of, of testing in your pipeline, right? Uh, uh, if you're doing some, uh, you know, integration tests, uh, uh, you know, before something goes out to production, actually attempt some unauthorized things and make sure that they, in fact, generate the proper permission denied log messages and, and don't give you data and things of that nature. Okay? Uh, now, this is standard stuff, right? Keep your parts of your system loosely coupled uh, and, and independent. That's pretty normal. And updates and patches are, are critical. Make sure that you have the ability to do that and that it's built into your, uh, into your build system. Uh, and last one, decommissioning. Someday your system is going to be replaced or taken offline or transitioned to something new and think about, what am I going to do with all that data, <laughs> right? It may be compliance critical or have regulatory implications. Uh, you know, I've seen situations where systems at the end of their life uh, were considered no longer important and weren't patched and updated and then they got attacked. <laughs> um, so think about how you dispose of your data, how you transition the critical secrets securely to the new system, uh, preserve the critical logs, and properly dispose of everything else. Okay, so that's it. These are kind of standard conclusions, and I have like one minute for any questions. And I'm sorry, I kind of got caught up in my anecdotes, didn't enough, leave enough time for Q&A. But uh, does anybody have any uh, uh, questions about these security principles? That was just 10 out of, you know, however many hundred, but I think, I hope that you felt they were good ones. Okay. All right. I'm out of time. So uh, thank you very much, and please apply uh, these security engineering principles.